Last time we talked about Thomas Aquinas' first and second ways of proving the existence of God. We looked at the structure of those arguments, saw that they have a kind of common structure. It's basically the same argument. The only difference is really the sub-argument for the second premise. They're about motion or change or causation. Causation seems the most general. And so last time I really brought out what I see as the structure of the argument as he presents it, using causation as our example. What I want to do today is think about something that is, well, the structure of the arguments, but in a different way. A little bit more elegant way, I think. So this is going to be a more technical video than some I've, taught, I've produced. This isn't going to be as strictly close to the text. Now, I do think what we say today is going to be really directly tied to what he has in mind, but nevertheless, it won't always sound like that. What I'm trying to do, though, is develop an elegant form of argument that reflects the general structure of the first and second ways, is formally valid, you can actually prove the conclusion as a theorem, and then reflect on the larger meaning of that, what it tells us about the nature of, well, the task of trying to prove God's existence, but also there are parallel arguments all throughout different areas of philosophy. We're going to see very similar arguments in epistemology, very similar arguments in different branches of metaphysics. And so thinking about the argument from this point of view isn't just useful for analyzing Aquinas or the possibility of a cosmological proof of God's existence. I think it's highly relevant to understanding a general pattern of argument that reappears in philosophy all over the place. So let's revisit Aquinas' first and second ways. We can think of them as relying on a certain kind of relation and really being an argument based on relational structures. It wasn't until the 19th and 20th centuries that we really had anything like a sophisticated theory of relations. But once we have one, I think we can see how to formulate this argument in a nice, elegant way and actually establish its validity. So let's do that. I'm going to use cause for the entire class of relations that we're, we have in mind here, but really this is going to apply to any such relation. So in metaphysics, we could take is composed of, for example. In epistemology, we could take justifies as the relation. There are lots of things we can do with this general structure, but for now, let's take the relation as cause. Here is a reconstruction of Aquinas's argument. The first premise, a premise of non-emptiness. In a certain domain, D, this world, the world of sense, the natural world, whatever it is, there are causes and effects. So we have things in this relation. Second premise, seriality. In that domain, D, everything has a cause. Finiteness, the third premise. The transitive closure of causation, let's call it cause star, can't be backwards infinite. And now, theorem. There is a first cause outside of D, outside the domain we started with. Well, let's first of all prove a little lemma. The lemma we're going to need is something that is reflected directly in what Aquinas gives us, or at least parts of it are. This relation, causation star, the transitive closure of causation, is irreflexive. It's asymmetric. It is transitive. And causation itself, the original relation, is irreflexive and asymmetric. In fact, we can say something stronger. Both of these relations, causation and its transitive closure, are acyclic, which is to say there are no cycles of causation. We never have one causing two, causing three, causing four, causing one again. No matter how large that loop is, there are no causal loops, is what comes out of this. Now, how could we prove our little lemma? Well, First of all, let's be careful about defining causation star. I've said it is the transitive closure of causation. That is to say, it's the smallest relation that is transitive and contains causation. Here's another way of thinking about it. We could say X causes star Y, if and only if there are intermediate causes. You can see here Aquinas' language about all the intermediate causes. If there are intermediate causes, such that X causes the first, the first causes the second, and so on, the last then causes Y. So causation star is transitive by definition. We've defined it as a transitive relation containing causation. 
to show that it's irreflexive, well, suppose that something caused itself, that A caused starred A. Well, then we would have a little loop. A would cause itself, and really, we'd have a backwards infinite chain. A is caused by A is caused by A is caused by A is caused by A, is caused by A dot, 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 going on forever. Well, similarly, we can prove that this relationship, the transitive closure of causation, is asymmetric. Suppose A caused star B and B caused star A. Then we'd have a similar backwards infinite chain. A is caused star by B, which is caused star by A, which is caused star by B, etc., etc., etc. Again, it doesn't matter how many things we have in that loop. We can put in a C. It's the same story. So we get acyclicity, and from that, irreflexivity and asymmetry, from the general notion that there can be no infinite backwards chains. Really, all we need is that principle of finiteness to get all of this. Well, it follows from our lemma that everything is caused by something else. We have as the seriality premise that everything is caused in the world of sense in this domain D. Now we can conclude that in domain D, everything is caused by something else. Again, something that is central to Aquinas's argument. Where do we go from here? Well, we can take a detour and define the notion of well-foundedness, what this shows is that the relationship of causation star is a well-founded relation. But that takes us even further from the structure of Aquinas' proof. So for now, I'll just observe that and move on. Here's a proof of our theorem that's very close, actually, to what Aquinas gives us as the second way. By non-emptiness, there are, in our domain, this world, the world of sense, the natural world, causes and effects, okay, a C0, let's say, and a C1, such that C1 is the cause of C0. Aquinas puts it this way, in the world of sense we find there's an order of efficient causes. By seriality, this C1 must have another cause, call it C2. Well, we know that causation is irreflexive, so this C2 can't be the same as C1. We know there are no loops, so it can't also be C0. So it's got to be something new. It can't be identical to any of the previous ones. So, after all, <laughs> C1, remember, can't cause itself. There's no known case, he says, where something causes itself. So all of these causes, as we build our chain back, have to remain distinct. They're all different. Well, as we continue to go back, as long as we remain in D, we're forced to add something else that's distinct from all the others to our chain. However, the finiteness premise says we can't go on to infinity. That chain has to stop somewhere. But it can't stop inside D because there would have to be another cause of it if it were in D, so we have to have it stop outside of our domain D. That is to say, outside the natural world, outside the world of sense, outside this world. The conclusion then is that there is a first cause outside our domain D, or in Aquinas' terms, there is a supernatural first cause. Well, once we realize that it's supernatural, it's not so shocking, maybe, to realize that it's natural for people to call it God. That is to say, if we can really talk about it as opposed to a collection of these things. So let's think about the structure of this argument. It's a valid argument. We can prove the theorem. But now the question is, well, are the premises correct? And we can also say, does the conclusion really give us what we want out of an argument for the existence of God? Let's start with the question of the premises. Non-emptiness, there are causes and effects. Well, we could deny that. I mean, one way to do it is David Hume's way, to say, well, one thing happens after another in the world, but there are no actual relations of cause and effect. Those are things we project onto the world, they're not in the world. So if we were Humean skeptics, we could perhaps challenge that first premise. We could also do it if we were Parmenides, or Zeno, maybe, arguing, look, my cat can't possibly move from here to here. Why? It would have to go first halfway, then halfway again, then halfway again. It would have to complete an infinite series of tasks to get over here, so it can't do it. But it just did, you could say. So much for Parmenides. Parmenides says, no problem. This world of sense does seem to have things moving, things changing, things causing other things, but that's all an illusion. I just proved to you it can't be real. Well, okay, we could be Parmenides. But the first premise, unless we're Hume or Parmenides, seems pretty safe. 
What about that seriality premise? The idea that everything in this domain actually has a cause? Well, that's tougher. I mean, we could argue that some things are just random, that some things have no causes at all. It's not clear, however, how bad it is for the person who's advocating this argument. We could say, well, all right, suppose it's not the entire natural world. It's just this chain of connected things, connected by causation. It's something like what we could say in the theory of relations is the field of that relation of causation. Well, let's just talk about that. So there are random stray events in addition. Whatever. We go back to something that is a first cause outside the natural world, as long as we've got anything that is causing anything inside the natural world. So it may be okay to admit there's some random stuff happening in addition. It's a little odd. God isn't the cause of it. So it's theologically something we probably don't want in the end, but it's not clear that it disrupts the force of the arg argument or its soundness. What about the finiteness premise? Well, here we get something a little more challenging. I mentioned last time that Al-Ghazali presents a challenge to this, says we couldn't have an a posteriori argument for this because we have no relevant experience. We have no way of arguing for an a priori because the structure of the integer shows that things could go back in both directions infinitely far. Nevertheless, it's rather hard to imagine an infinite descending or infinite backwards series of causes. And so it's not impossible, maybe, but nevertheless hard for us to get our minds around. It seems very plausible. Now, there's another way of thinking about this, though, that doesn't quite commit us to the universe having an infinite age or an infinite series of causes. We could really say, look, it's true when we think about causes, when we think about explanations, when we think about motion, we go back only so far. We say that's the cause. But we could go back further, just as in giving an explanation, we start somewhere. But somebody could always say, well, take the starting point of your explanation. Why that? Maybe that needs to be explained. So we could, like Karl Popper perhaps, or the pragmatists, think that, look, in the end, it's a kind of pragmatic question how far we go. There's always the possibility that we might go further. So we can't be sure there's an end to that. Maybe, <laughs> actually, to use a, uh, an issue in metaphysics, something that uh, Bertrand Russell mentioned in thinking about metaphysical composition, Maybe it's turtles all the way down. Uh, and, you know, it maybe in this case, turtles all the way back. Causes all the way back. It's not clear that that's an incoherent idea, but it's also not clear that we can fully make sense of it. So I think the status of that premise has to remain a question mark. The really serious worry, it seems to me, is about the conclusion. After all, the conclusion leads us to something outside our original domain that is a first cause. That seems like an important conclusion, a supernatural first cause. But, as I mentioned at the end of last time, we don't yet have uniqueness. We just have the existence of at least one such first cause. Well, it would be nice to have exactly one, at most one, as well as at least one. But we don't have that. And so, that's a bit worrisome. Why should we call it God? Why can we call it, it even, it might be them? And after all, you might think, ah, there's a group of gods. Maybe a polytheist could say, sure, there are lots of these supernatural causal forces. Or maybe an animist could say, yes, everything, in fact, has its own supernatural cause. Our world is a world of spirits. And so we need something to take these causes and put them together. This argument all by itself doesn't do that. And so we still have to confront a challenge that Kant puts forward when he thinks about these kinds of arguments. He says, maybe you can get an argument for God as the first mover, the first cause, in effect, the creator. But how do we get from that to A, <laughs> the fact that there is only one God, and B, the thought that that God has all the other perfections we want to attribute to God? that that God is all-good, all-powerful, all-knowing. 